Today on the Cam and Journal podcast, we are joined by Nathan Turner, who um, is he is a business person. He's an entrepreneur. He is into mortgage note investing and franchising, all this sort of fascinating thing. So this is this is one for um, my business and entrepreneurial folks, which is a big market for us. But um, I realize all my other listeners would be quite bored by all of this. So uh, skip one, you know, there's 220 episodes, there's something else to listen to. Um, and so we're, but we're very excited to learn more about this, this market and his, his business journey. So welcome, Nathan, to the Cameron Journal podcast. Hey, pleasure to be here. Thank you. Yes. Well, uh, why don't you begin from the beginning and tell us a little bit about yourself and your business? Sure. So uh, my name is Nathan Turner. I live up in Canada. We're just outside of Calgary, Alberta. So for reference, most people have at least heard of Banff uh, and the Rocky Mountains. We're about an hour and a half just east of there and love to go and visit. We typically go mountain range a little bit closer called Kananaskis, which is even, I think, prettier, but you know, I'm biased. But uh, everything I do is in the U.S. So I live in Canada, but all of my business is, is U.S. based. Currently, I buy U.S. mortgage notes. So instead of buying houses, I'm just buying the mortgage that's attached to the property. So the property ends up being my collateral. Uh, but really, all I'm doing is buying the loan, the paperwork attached to that property. Yes, I mean, yes, it's, um, you know, with that sort of thing, you could be a one man financial crisis if you don't watch out. <laughs> <laughs> so we've we've had bad experiences with that before. Um, so, uh, yes, so be, 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 be very, be very careful about all that. I joke, of course. Um, yeah. But uh, how did you get into that? Uh, well, you mentioned like I was, I did franchising before. So my, my first real business was the Curves franchise. We ended up having two of those, uh, which was great. And then it was not great. Uh, so we turned to real estate more just kind of um, as something different. We needed something else to do to help supplement these, these dying franchises. Uh, and it was not long after that, I got um, introduced to a group of guys that were living in California. They bought all these properties out in the Midwest they were supposed to just flip out that whole portfolio out to somebody else, uh, but that ended up going south. So by the fall of 2008, they still own these properties, and now they're in big trouble. They way overpaid by that point, uh, and so my task was to come in and try to help fix it, whatever we could do to fix it. <clears throat> so it was a uh, colleague of mine. We were working together on this, and um, we thought we'd invented seller financing. We started just selling these houses on terms and creating notes, not even knowing that that's what they were called or that's what we were doing. And it wasn't after, after doing a little more research and a little more digging into what we were doing on how we could exit some of these loans that we we're creating. Uh, that's when I was kind of more introduced to that whole world of mortgage note investing and just kind of took off from there. Now, uh, just this past year, we put together a, an investment fund so people can invest into that and help me do what I love to do while getting a great return. Yes, no, abso absolutely. It's um, wh why did you decide to to stay in this business? Uh, you know, a big part of it was uh, when I was doing the real estate thing, uh, I was doing fix and flip. And then I ended up being a landlord just on house that we weren't able to sell as the market turned in 2008. So I did what I thought you were supposed to do. And I rented out the property uh, and I liked the cash flow, but I didn't like anything else attached to being a landlord. I found it is that, a lot of headaches. Yes. It's a lot of headaches. So eventually we were able to sell the house and get out of that. And so when we started doing what I'm doing now, I realized that I get all of that cash flow, the part that I liked, without any of the headaches that go along with it. So to me, it's kind of the best of both worlds. I still get to be attached to real estate. That's my security. Uh, but I don't actually own the house. So I don't have any of the headaches of taking care of the property itself. Well, I mean, that's why the big banks did it, right? You know, exactly. they didn't have to deal with originating loans or setting up offices to talk to people. And the small offices loved it because they could offload these new loans quickly, yeah. get the capital and then do more loans. You know, yeah. it's a great system if people act responsibly, you know, right. and don't, you know, package together, you know, crap and call it AAA. 
Yeah. So that's that's a really important thing, <laughs> that whole honesty <laughs> and integrity thing, as it yeah. turns out, vital, vital, vital. <laughs> yeah, go watch the big short that it'll explain everything. If you can follow. Yes, <laughs> yeah, it's, yes. It's a great movie talking about how all that came to pass. And yeah, the other the other really good one is uh, Too Big to Fail, which was based on the uh, Aaron Ross Sorkin book. Yeah. Um, which interestingly enough has Cynthia Nixon from Sex and the City in it, yeah. which is just, I'm just, I can, yeah, I'm just kind of like, I can, what's what was the agent call on that one? Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, um, it, 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 de- it definitely, um, is a very interesting sort of market. What would you say is like your biggest, like challenge in this business? What, what, you know, um, what's kind of the biggest troublesome part? You know, I, it's really kind of a case of balancing available capital and available deals. Uh, finding the deals, we talk about it in this space a lot where it's very much relationship based. So you've got to get in and start to talk to people and be known and know people uh, so that people will start pitching you some of these deals. Uh, and then on the other side, you've got to have the capital available when those deals come across your desk. So that's that's really... I think probably the most challenging thing is just balancing that. Absolutely. So I imagine then you're very familiar with the um, ups and downs of the American real estate market. Um, what, what is, you know, what do you, what is your view of the real estate market right now? I I seeing signs of cracking where uh, a lot of markets are going either flat or starting to drop. Uh, and I think that's going to continue, um, you know, my crystal ball, I think we're going to see another recession here coming up soon, whether that's this year, next year, how long it's going to last, how good bad it's going to be. Uh, those are the things I don't know. Uh, one of the things I like about notes though, is that as the market conditions go down, um, we're still very well protected because we've got that real estate as our backup plan. If people can't make payments and 99 times out of 100, we can get with the borrowers and help them get back on their feet and still make payments. We'll just restructure their loan. But if for some reason we can't, uh, that property is still the backup. Uh, If we have to, we can go and foreclose and take back the property and sell it to recoup our investment. No, no, of course. Of course. I was just I was just imagining, you know, in terms of you looking for new deals and notes to invest in, if there were markets you were looking at, markets you were avoiding, um, we've had a couple conversations about the situation in Florida and, um, I was doing an appearance the, last night about politics and whatnot. And the host also yeah. works in insurance. And I was talking about, yeah, it's, you know, don't try to buy house insurance in Florida, Florida, it's practically impossible. Um, and yeah. that's causing huge real estate issues. Um, yeah. so I was wondering if there was any, you know, specific places that you love, specific places that you hated, um, yeah. Yes, but for very different reasons. So Florida is kind of a neutral one for me. I, I don't mind Florida. I don't love it, but I don't hate it. Um, I'll tell you like the New England area, New York, New Jersey, Maine, that whole corner up there, their foreclosure laws are a little nutty. <laughs> and so if it goes to uh, a case where we have to foreclose, most of the time, like I say, that's on a vacant property. But if we need to foreclose, uh, it takes forever. It just like literally, you know, two, three years to get a foreclosure done versus on the other side of the spectrum there, you've got Texas, which in theory, you can get it done in two months. The fastest I've ever done it is four. So it's, it, those are kind of the opposite ends of the spectrum. So I'm always kind of planning for the worst case scenario, which in my mind is a foreclosure. Uh, because of that, I tend to stay out of New England. Texas is definitely a favorite. No, that certainly that certainly um, that certainly makes makes sense. Um, what, what would your advice be to those who want to get into this industry? I would say get some education, um, and that's not a pitch because I don't teach, but uh, I can hook you up with people that do if you're interested. The thing to realize is that this is not real estate; it's real estate related, and real estate plays a part. But this is a finance game. So you have to understand the rules of finance and how that works. Different states have different rules. Um, Some states, for example, you'll need a a debt collector's license just to hold a loan. Uh, Other states don't have that kind of restriction. So just understanding how it works and 
what you can and can't do, things you can say, things you should not say, uh, all of those things in together. So make sure you know what you're doing before you get into it. Well, yes. I mean, it is a, it is a very, it is a very sort of, I would not say it's terribly complicated, but you definitely want to go in yeah. understanding the business. Yeah, like, exactly. You know, soup to nuts, beginning to end, how it all plays out, all this type of thing. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So tell me about your in, your investor fund. So our fund, uh, like I say, we just put it together last year. It's a Regulation D 506C for anybody who's following that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, what that means is um, it registered with the government. We are only allowed to take on accredited investors. And the, what that means is people that make at least $200,000 a year or have a million dollars of net worth outside of their primary residence. Um they can then invest in that. We pay out an 8% annual return, um, all backed by the real estate. And that's kind of the basics of it. Minimum investment, 50,000. Maximum investment, 1 million. And put the money in. You don't have to think about it again. You'll get your quarterly reports and payments. That's about it. Done and dusted. Yeah. Well, and I think it's, I think the nice, in, in my mind, um, if I were ever in the class of people that would do invest like this, um, uh -huh. which I will never be, I do this, um, is, uh, you know, you're not with a nameless, faceless institution. You're with you. Exactly. Nathan, we can ring on the phone, you know, sort of thing. It's like there's an actual human. I mean, that was one of the problems with the with the big banks in 2008 is no mm -hmm. one was actually responsible for any of that. No right. one knew what was going on. That's why we had a crash. <laughs> That's yes. why it all came yeah. crashing down. Um, but I think, you know, like it, it you know, at, like with you, it's kind of like, there's, it's like, we can point to the person who's in charge, this guy here, like, you know, it's, it's like we yeah. know who the progenitor yeah. of it is. And I think for me, given, you know, the investing stuff that I've gone through and all this type of thing, I, yeah, I would never want to be involved in a big nameless faces institution like that. I yeah. prefer much smaller, like who is accountable and do we know them, <laughs> you know, right. like, sort of right. thing. Um, yeah. And I think that, you know, I imagine would make people a lot more comfortable. Yeah. And it's very much a, you know, no like and trust kind of a situation. Um, and that's true on both sides. So I'm the guy that the investors talk to. I'm also the guy that the borrowers talk to people living in the houses. So it's, you're not going to talk to, you know, some robot. You're not going to talk to somebody overseas. You're not going to talk to somebody that doesn't know anything or doesn't have the ability to make decisions. You're talking to me. And so that, uh, yeah. I think that helps a lot. No, I mean, I, so I'm, I'm an investor in a company called ground floor and we do fractional real estate investing for fix and flips mostly. Cool. Um, yeah, okay. There is some, yeah, there's some new stuff coming out in multifamily and all this type of thing, which I haven't really gotten into yet because I don't have the time. Um, yeah. But I'm also invested in the long-term success of the company because I was an early investor in one of their fundraising rounds. Yeah. And, and I liked it because I never had a lot of capital to in, to invest because I've yeah. been a full-time working artist and I do this. Um, sure. And they made it very, you know, kind of available for the everyday person, um, yeah. including a full-time working artist uh, who does yeah. this. And yeah. um, and I was um, kind of always um, floored that they didn't make a better use of the asset of the investors. Talking about that human connection sort of thing. And okay. so recently, a lot of these fix and flips have not been working out and people have said we need to start doing drive-bys of these properties because some i you know i'm invested but it costs a lot i do small amounts across a lot of properties there's some people sure. that do big amounts into like one yeah. and so we were talking about being like yeah we just and there was actually one case i was in a house for three years and it was actually one of the investors who happened to be a general contractor that lived not but three streets over. He ended up finishing the house. He's the oh, only wow. reason we got paid. And so yeah. there's kind of been this movement in the company of being like, okay, everybody, we need to sign up on a spreadsheet. Where are you? How far are you willing to drive? And what houses do we have near you? And you should be driving by them. And yeah. that, you know, because they basically, I was like, well, it's expensive to put on a team to drive by properties. You don't need to do that. You have everybody who's invested in this company to yeah. go and, and look at these 
and look at these properties. I bored you with all of that to say, yeah. how how do you run this business so handily, being, I would imagine, so far away from most of the assets? Yeah, and that's a great question, great point. Um, a few things. So yes, I, I live in Canada. I don't go and visit all the properties, but I do have somebody local definitely go buy the property. So before we buy, uh, remember we're buying the loan attached to the property. So with the property itself, what I'm looking to verify is that there's enough value there with enough of an equity spread so that if we do have some kind of downturn in the market, if something does happen in the property, there's still enough value in the property to cover the amount that we've bought the loan for. So for an example, let's say that um, the freezy numbers, the house value is 150,000. The balance on the loan is 100,000. I might buy that for 75,000. So we've got a ton of room there between what I paid and the value of the property uh, in case we do need to go through and do a foreclosure and we take that back, even if there's a downturn in the economy, we're still well covered. So all that to That's say, I, I do have somebody go out there and check out the house, make sure that we actually lay eyes on it and not just Google <laughs> eyes on that. Right. Uh, yeah. Somebody who's actually checking it out and making sure that A, it's there and B, it's what we think it is. No, I mean, sometimes in real estate, I mean, doing fix and flips is kind of like, because sometimes houses burn down, things happen, all this type of thing. Yeah. And there have been times where we've had in, you know, discussions on this for me, like, does the house still exist? Are there four things sticking up with a roof on top? Like, you no, know, yeah. where is sort of thing? Um, and in one case, it wasn't. It had burned down and the city had cleared it away and all this yeah. type of thing. And we now yeah. owned dirt and some leaves. Yeah. That's what we, you know, that's what we owned after we foreclosed on the loan. So, um, yeah. Yes. Yeah, so no, I mean that. Yeah, that absolutely, absolutely makes sense to sense to do that. Kind of an existential question. Um, yeah. If all your business is in the U.S., it seems to me it would be time to immigrate. <laughs> we looked at doing that years ago. Uh, it is much more difficult than it should be <laughs> for one. It definitely get, is. Yeah, to get the visa and everything else, it was a complicated enough process that when we took a step back and reevaluated, we're like, okay do we need to be there? And the answer is no. So there's really no reason to, you know, take on that whole process, the expense, uprooting my family, all the rest. Nah, we're good. We'll stay where yeah. we're Yeah. Yeah. I imagine though, when it, when it comes to taxes, that's got to be complicated. You know, and not as much as I thought it would be. That was one of my first questions when I, when I got started as well. So I met with three different accountants. They all told me three different things, but, but, the thing that they all agreed on is there's a tax treaty between the U.S. and Canada. So anything that I pay for taxes in the U.S. is a credit to my Canadian taxes. That makes it much easier. So then I'm, I'm not, yes. having, you know, and I'm not getting double taxed. I just have to file two returns. Yes. Yes. Which is, which I mean, I just, I have enough trouble with our own tax system. I can't imagine trying to deal with another country's tax system. Just like, uh, yeah, it's so, it's so it's so tedious it's yeah. yeah i i have to i that's what i miss about living in a state with no state income tax i didn't yeah. have to do state level returns for 10 years and i have to now and it's boo like yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> no well, we've so, got our u.s accountant we've got a canadian accountant they talk to each other and figure it out and bill me yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's but this is the the, re the reason why i kind of ask this sort of you know weird stuff is a lot of this stuff <laughs> A lot of these people come on the show or I see elsewhere and it's mm -hmm. all, you know, the hype and the money and the opportunity and the lifestyle. And I'm sitting over here yeah. being like, I don't care what Lamborghini you bought. I need to know taxes, tax regime. I sure. need to, you know, yeah. I need to understand, you know, what is the day-to-day -day operations of what you're doing? You know, all this sort of, you know, the actual yeah. stuff that it takes to run a business and generate a return. Um, and I think realists, I don't know if you found this, but I feel like real estate suffers from a lot of hype and not a lot of asking like, yeah, what do you do sure. if you live in Canada and do business in the United States? What does yeah. that look like from yeah. a tax compliance, legal perspective, all this type of thing? And people, yeah. I feel like they jump into it. They spend a lot of money with a big name who spends a lot of ads on Facebook Fair, and yeah. don't really understand the business they're getting into and then lose their shirt. Right. Right. No. And that's something to understand with any investment, there is always risk involved. So I actually have a presentation. Um, we call it, 
<laughs> I called it who's on first. So I, I go through Abbott and Costello's whole routine and we talk about who's on first, who's on second, who's on third. And I, I do case studies ranging everywhere from a strikeout all the way to a home run. And there are examples for all of those. And most of the time they're, for, they're you know, singles and doubles. Uh, the home runs are the ones that everyone likes to talk about because they're really fun and they're cool and it sounds awesome. Those are rare, just like in any baseball game. Any baseball game, it's it's one with singles and doubles. And yes, there are strikeouts in there as well. So to understand, it's a real thing. It's not a get rich quick. Uh, we're not talking about, you know, buying a note and all of a sudden you're a millionaire. This is a, it takes time and it takes effort and it takes some discipline on your part. So all that, there's the caveat and all of that. It's no, really no, I no, no. I mean, but, but that's, I mean, again, that's, that's the, when I, when I do guests like these, the only yeah. reason I have them on is to yeah. tell this story and that side, sure. because there's way too many grifters who are out selling courses, selling a lot of hype with various like, websites, all this type of thing. Yeah. And, and, and I, I feel sorry for the people because they oftentimes don't have any experience with this and they don't know to answer these questions. They don't know. They yeah. don't know what they don't know. Sure. And they believe all the hype and they end up spending a lot of money, you know, to, and then end up, you know, kind of, you know, having a problem. Yeah. Because um, they, you know, didn't understand. Yeah. You've got, you know, taxes, you live in compliance of all these extra things. Does yeah. your business and do your deal still make sense given these other costs and concerns, yeah. you know, and are you ready to take on that stress and all this type of thing? And a lot of, you know, I find the vast majority of people want someone that's a little bit more set and forget it. And there are mm -hmm. some people that can provide that for fee. Mm -hmm. um, sure. And there are other, you know, and there are other people who it's kind of like, yeah, if you're going to get, if you're going to be about it, then be about it. But at least know where the problems are, potential problems are before you get into it. So Definitely. yeah, do your homework for sure. And uh, whether it's me or anybody else, listen to what they're saying, but then do the extra homework because yes, there are pitfalls. Of course there are. This is investing. There's in yeah. 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 No, absolutely. Absolutely. But I I for me personally, I'm much more comfortable with the risk that I know than risk that I don't know. And especially when you're, you know, getting in, you know, starting a a, a new business or anything like that, then it, it's very to get to lay the land of uh, of understanding how business works in general, and then understanding yeah. how your particular business works and what the you know issues and and difficulties are yeah. along the way. Yeah. So. Yeah, I love that. So, so like I said, my first business, my first real business was uh, the Curves franchise, and the thing that I kind of figured out really quickly is that I just love business. I love talking about my business, other people's business, like how does it work? What's working? What's not, you know, how are you making money doing that? What are your margins? Like, I love just kind of digging into those details because they're all different and there's all, you know, good things. There's bad things. It's just a lot of fun. I, that's a fun thing for me to talk about anyway. No, no, no. I mean, I think, I think if there's one, <laughs> there's one thread I've heard and I was kind of like a business and investing nerd in high yeah. school. I mean, I watched CNBC because I thought it was interesting. Um, yeah. Said no one ever in the you know, <laughs> sort of thing. Um, <laughs> and uh, and I I think um, one of the, I remember I saw an interview with Donnie Deutsch years ago. And he realized, you know, be in college and everything and being ADHD as hell that he needed to do things where he felt like he was having fun because then he yeah. would be engaged and actually do it. And, uh, and I think that's a very important thing mm -hmm. for P in terms of, if you want to start something, do something that you think you'll have fun at or be reasonably good at sort of thing. Um, mm -hmm. And if it's kind of a miserable slog, then maybe don't do it. Yeah. I will say I did not take my own advice on this matter <laughs> um, in terms of I was telling someone, I said, if I were to start all over again, I wouldn't even do writing or content. I would probably start a laundromat or something. Quite frankly, the money's better. Um, you know, the long, I mean, the, the, the long, slow, boring business for the win, you know, yeah. it's um, that's um, in terms of, you know, if you really want to you know, make money and all this type of thing. That's the, um, that's the, that's the best way to do it. You know, I would literally, I told someone I would do laundry, I would do laundromats and vending machines. 
Yeah. Actually, I knew somebody who had vending machines. That, yeah, him and his dad, that's what they'd done for 40 years. And yeah. also um, arcade <clears throat> games. You know, oh, like, cool. yeah, yeah, yeah. They were they were in arcade games, vending machines, all this type of thing. And I was kind of like, yeah, if I had it to do all over again, I would do like vending machines and laundromats, and yeah, <laughs> you yeah. know, just kind of go on with myself, you know, sort of thing, and not you know bother with you know becoming an international media brand because right. <laughs> yes, yeah. that's way too yeah. much work, <laughs> and the money's bad. <laughs> yeah. No, I so, totally yeah. I just find something you like and then do that. You learn how to monetize it and do that. And like you say, the, the long, boring stuff, it pays. It pays. It does. I mean, and that's, that's like where it's like, if you want to have, like for me, I did this because my passion was writing. I wanted to write books. I wanted to be a writer, all the same thing. That's how I ended up here, um, yeah. you know, sort of thing. Um, and But I mean, yeah, it's like, if, it, if you're not particularly attached to anything, I'd be, I would say go get a long, slow, boring business. Yeah. If you don't. Know, it's, um, you know, and especially if you're, you know, if you own a laundromat and you're handy and can do your own repairs and clean out your own drive and stuff, cost savings. I mean, it, you yeah. know, and you, and you can hire someone reasonable amount to keep it, get a little wash dry fold operation going done and dusted, you yeah. know, um, particularly with a great location near a lot of apartments, um, you'll be good to go. Um, yeah. and so, yeah, I mean, and literally that's, that's, I think I would say that's the one thing I realized about business in general and i feel like this kind of mirrors maybe your franchise to mortgage note journey is mm -hmm. the flashiest most public thing is oftentimes not what actually makes money exactly and it, it's really the quieter less well-known stuff is yeah. what gets you the millionaire next door status yeah. you know um and I, I don't know if you I don't know if you found that in how your business has transitioned. But like I said, if I had to do all over again, yeah, laundromats and vending machines. Absolutely. For sure. I <laughs> do you remember that show, uh, Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yes. 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 Even back then, I would watch those shows and be. <clears throat> I would think. I would actually much rather be rich and not famous. And so <laughs> that to yeah. me is my goal. I'm not actually interested in having everybody know who I am. Like that's, if people say hello to me, sure, that's great. And I'll definitely chat, but I just want to make money. You know, I'm, I'm here to support myself and my family and whatever else, if I can help somebody along the way, I'm more than happy to do that, but I don't need to be famous. So that the, the flashy object thing, Typically, like you say, it's not the thing that's going to bring you actual money. It's not going to create actual wealth. It may be, you know, a flash in the pan. You might get lucky once or twice, but pick something that's just going to pay long term. Yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, this is ordinarily the part of the show where we ask you to do plugs and where people can find you online and on social media and all this type of thing. I didn't look close enough on your matchmaker to see if you had any of that stuff. So I'm really <laughs> hoping you do. Otherwise, this will be very embarrassing. Yeah. No, not at all. So I've got earnestinvesting.com is the website. Uh, if you go there, actually, that'll take you to a second website. I do a, an annual conference. Education only. Nobody's allowed to pitch. You'll never hear run to the back of the room. That's just not something that I will allow. But uh, it's all about node investing. So we just come together and network and learn together. Um, but the link for that is on there too. That's called Diversified Mortgage Expo. Uh, and other than that, I'm on Facebook, Nathan Turner. LinkedIn, Nathan Turner. Uh, you can find me on there. I'd love to connect and chat. Absolutely. Well, excellent. Um, thank you so much for coming on the show. Fascinating, fascinating journey. If there was one parting bit of advice for a budding entrepreneur what would it be oh keep going whatever it is whether it's good or bad you're gonna have those highs and lows just keep going just keep going push through there's gonna be something coming up so just keep plugging away <laughs> that's it mm. all right thank you nathan thanks for coming on the show hey thank you That's all for this episode of the Cameron Journal Podcast. Thank you so much for listening. Visit us online 
at CameronJournal.com. We're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And I love to talk to my followers and listeners, so please feel free to uh, get us on social media at Cameron Cowan on Twitter. And we'll see you next time on the Cameron Journal Podcast. Thank you.